So are you still with us? Enjoy this talk. Hi. I uh, just want to ask a question first. Um, who among you has changed their consumption in the direction of, for instance, less, eating less animal products, or has volunteered for an animal organization, or has donated to an animal organization? Okay, that's a lot of people. And who has ever heard the criticism like, shouldn't you, like, focus on humans first? Have you heard that? That's also a lot of people. Okay, so what I want to do in this talk is, um, is give you some reasons why it's actually good to, um, to focus on animals. Not necessarily at the cost of humans, but uh, I want to tell you that um, we don't have to wait till the last human uh, is fed uh, or is uh, released from suffering to start caring about animals. Uh, so like uh, Chris said, I just about me, I um, started EVA, Ethical Vegetarian Alternative. I was director of that for 15 years. Uh, so recently, I'm basically a speaker, uh, and a speaker I speak for um, Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy. So me and Mel and Joy, an American psychologist, we give trainings all around the world to activists. We help them communicate more efficiently, and I also have a blog called The Vegan Strategies. Um, and uh, because I want to be effective, of course, I've stolen some slides from other people and I didn't make them myself. Uh, so thanks to these people and organizations. And uh, yeah, this also explains why my presentation is aesthetically a bit of like a, a mix. Um, <clears throat> so why animals? So this we, we call this cost prioritization. We, we, we look at which domains are useful to invest in, to invest time or money in. And the question now is why would we pick animals? Why would we pick animals when there are so many refugees suffering, fleeing their countries, fleeing misery and war, etc.? Where there's like, where, why would you choose animals in a world where there's like natural disaster? Um, every few months there's like a, a huge big disaster which um, strikes and um, afflicts millions of people. Or there's like um, children affected with a hun uh, um, horrible disease like cancer, etc. Or there's poverty in our own country. Why would we pick animals? So you might be personal, and you're probably not because most people in this room I see have done something for animals, but you might be somebody who says, well, there's a, a big difference between humans and animals. There's just a difference. Humans are humans, and animals are animals. And the suffering of an animal can never be, of a human can never be compared to animal suffering. Now, or you can say like maybe um, a human life is worth more than an animal life. And I think some, some of those considerations, I mean, I'll leave it up to you whether you think them or not, but we might call them speciesist, in the sense that, I guess you heard the term speciesism. Speciesism means that we will distinguish between two beings and say that the interests of one being are more important than the other being merely on the basis of the fact that they are of a different species. So the analogy is, of course, with racism. You're going to say that a white person is more valuable or their interest counts more than a black person because he or she is white, which, of course, is, is bullshit. It's not morally relevant to say that. And it's not morally relevant also what species you are. It's not morally relevant in terms of how much you suffer. Whether you are an animal or a human, your suffering can be the same. But even if you don't accept that, and even if you what we call discount animal suffering, you say like, this suffering is much more important, even if you reason like that, there's still a lot of reason to care about this because the scale is so big, because the suffering here is so big. So you could even say like, this suffering is 100 times more important than this suffering. Well, even then, you would care or you would do something about this suffering. Okay, let's look at that. So speciesism, like I said, this is the, the prejudice or discrimination based on species, especially discrimination against animals. But you could be you can be a speciesist all you want, and still there would be, I think, an ethical obligation to care about animals. Uh, this is another example of speciesism, actually. So it's, I mean, the case is, of course, that we care about this animal but not about this animal. We make a distinction merely on the basis of species, right? There is no, I mean, if you would say that this being is, or this being, 
is much more able to experience pain and suffering, has a, like a larger consciousness, and is able to like experience a larger um, array of feelings or whatever, then that will be a relevant moral difference, a morally relevant difference. But the mere species difference is not a morally relevant one here. Okay? So why focus on animals? So first, yes? Yeah, it's not it's not an easy question, and it's not because because we can't really answer it that there's some things that are not clear. I mean, we can we can easily say that, for instance, pigs are as intelligent as dogs, and they should matter, and cows should matter. That and it doesn't mean that we are uncertain about mollusks or mussels or shrimp or mosquitoes, it doesn't mean that we are uncertain about these things, that we are uncertain about the other things. So the line drawing thing is a bit of a, yeah, I don't know if it's always the best argument. It, it, it can be an argument in the future when we've solved these things, but uh, right now we are so sure about the suffering of so many creatures that I think the line drawing argument is a bit of a distraction. Okay, I'll, I'll leave some room for questions um, at the end. Um, I'm going to show you some things about the scale, and um, maybe um, you've, you've heard this, this idea that when I send you a letter and ask for your donations, I'll be more successful if I give you the story of just one child instead of talking about 100,000 children in Africa. Have you heard that, that statistic? Like that it's, it's more successful, uh, and I can get more money from you if I talk about that one particular concrete child rather than about 100,000, right? So this is called a kind of psychic numbing. So this is a, a graph that represents that. Your emotional response is higher when there's a lower number of individuals involved. And the higher this, this number of individuals gets, I mean, the less we kind of care if we're not thinking about it very much, if we, if we are especially emotional only about it, okay? So that's, I think, it's a very regrettable response, and it's not the right response, because if you care about this being, this world-renowned photo uh, photograph with this refugee child washed ashore, well, then why wouldn't you care about this refugee camp with thousands and thousands of people that are potentially also in danger of being washed ashore like that. So what I want to say is, when we talk about a hundred thousand people, or a million people, or a billion beings, that is just a collection of individuals that we care about. Okay, so these numbers do count, they're very important. So, some numbers. Seven billion people in the world, and of course, many of them are suffering, many of them are not in ideal conditions, but, um, I mean, at the very most, we have seven billion suffering beings. Fortunately, that's not the case, okay? We're not suffering all the time, not all of us all the time. So, a big part of that, a big part of these people are, to a large extent, happy or satisfied or content a large number of times. The problem is not also not really here. Um, this is the number of cats and dogs in the world. 600 million cats and 500 million dogs. That's, of course, an estimation. Nobody's like out there to like count them individually. Um, <clears throat> But now let's look at some other numbers. This is the global live farm mammals numbers. So we have cattle, the cows, the sheep, the pigs, the goats, and rabbits. So these are the animals that we raise for human consumption, for food. And together we have 5 billion animals at any moment in the year present. That's on a yearly basis, that's more animals, because these animals, most of them don't live an entire life. So they are replaced within that year, they're replaced by others. So in the course of an entire life, you have many more than that. Okay, so now let's add something. We had global life farm animals, so now we have global life land farm animals. And the previous image, so this whole thing, now becomes just this thing. Right, the mammals are here, and we added the chickens, these are chickens, the layer hens, the ones that provide us with eggs, and the broiler chickens, the meat chickens. And here's ducks and turkeys. And we are now at 34 billion beings at every moment of the year. 34 billion. And then let's add global life farm animals, the fish. Now we're at 114 billion. Okay, so these are farmed fish. 
just uh, the ones we farm. And then we add wild fish. That's all the fish that we catch in the sea. And you see where we were originally, it's, it's only a very small slice anymore. And now we're at 1,614 billion animals. So these numbers are, of course, mind-boggling, and you don't know what to do with it anymore. Um, but it's just to show that the scale of this problem, of these being suffering, is gigantic. And, you know, usually they say, like, don't put too much text on your slides. This is not my slide, by the way. Uh, but uh, I, just, I just took this slide because uh, it lists a lot of complications and health problems that these animals that live in these intensive factory conditions uh, are suffering from, eh? from mutilation to parasites to uh, uh, boredom and frustration and stress and anxiety. Their lives are, on the whole, pretty terrible for billions and billions of animals every year. Okay? So a question we could ask then is like, which of these animals are most important to care about? What would your guess be? What, what would you think that is priority among animals to care about and to give money to, to invest in. Yeah. Uh, chickens. chickens? Why is that? There are a lot of them. Why are there so many of them? Because um, they're small. And yes. They need a lot of them. Very good. So there's many chickens because they're so small. There's, do you know how many chickens go into one cow? It's not a joke. <laughs> it's 250. More or less, 250 chickens go into one cow. So for every cow you slaughter to have its to have their um, meat, you need to have the same amount of meat. You need 250 chickens. So that's 250 individuals. Okay. So that's why uh, the suffering of chickens is is very important because there's so many of them. And the same goes for fish. Okay. So fish are usually small. I mean, if you eat whales, that that's there's there's an argument to be made to eat whales because they're so big or elephants. But, um, but basically, the smaller the animal, the, the more we have of them. And that's also why, why it's, it's a bit of a, of a pity that um, if you look at the environmental argument for lower meat consumption, the, uh, the argument that environmental organizations make um, to help you eat less meat, they will say, start with red meat. And also the health argument says, like, start eat less red meat, right? They don't talk about chicken and fish, these are considered healthy. But if we do that, and if people shift from uh, beef to chicken, from cows to chicken, then we just kill more animals and we make more animals suffer. So that would be a very bad move. Fish, um, like I said, uh, there's so many of them, and also a problem is that the killing of fish is not regulated. So we can, we, um, when we, when industry, kills chickens or uh, pigs or cows, there are certain rules to be followed. They have to be stunned, etc. With chickens, uh, sorry, with fish, that's not the case. So you can uh, do whatever you want with fish, and um, it's not that they're dead uh, upon being pulled out of the water. It's not like when we are drowning, we will be dead in two minutes. And some kind of like Buddhist yoga master or something may take five minutes or whatever. But, uh, but normally we're dead in two minutes. A fish can take... Uh, up to four hours or more to uh, to die, so that's a pretty long, a pretty serious death battle. Um, so chickens and fish as some priority animals. So another reason to choose animals is this neglect that Sam mentioned. Um, you know that there's you experience that there's a lot of moral outreach often about when like an artist does something with pigs or like somebody throws like a cat in the air for a movie or the sis of the lion, or whatever, all these like little individual anecdotes, um, they get a lot of outreach. And you would think that, sometimes you hear this criticism, why are we all of a sudden so enraged about Cecil the lion, and um, the migrant crisis or something, uh, we, we, we're much more silent about that. And you could think sometimes that, you, you could have the impression that um, um, we care more about animals at some time, at some point, but um, that doesn't translate, or you wouldn't tell that, and it's not true if you look at the donations. This is, uh, these, are, these are American numbers, but I don't see any reason why they would be different in other parts of the world. These are the donations that, of all the donations that people in the United States give, this is the part that goes to animals. That's 1.5%. Okay? And of that 1.5%, this part, goes to what? 
To what? Cats. Exactly, to cats and dogs. So it's only this part that goes to farmed animals. So what we have for these 1.5 trillion beings that are suffering is 0.015% of donations. Okay? That's not very much. And that would suggest that we move something to somewhere else. And then the third argument to choose animals is tractability. Tractability means how much headway can we, can we make into solving this problem, into solving this issue. Are there reliable interventions that can help us reduce the suffering? And there are. Um, and there is hope. If you look at other movements in history, so I'm talking now about the animal rights movement, which is the movement to like help society see that animals are living beings who need to be respected, who have rights, maybe, or at least who shouldn't be in pain. Well, we've seen that before. We've seen that with the slavery movement, anti-slavery movement. We've seen, seen that with the women's liberation movement. And we've seen that with the LGBT movement, right? And each of these movements has made, in pretty short time, incredible progress, progress. And that's very hopeful. And we see that, you can't read this from afar, but um, these are um, tipping points, so to speak, for these different causes, for abortion, for women's suffrage, for interracial marriage, etc. Sometimes something happens, some, some case, some uh, case in front of a, a jury, or whatever, trial, and all of a sudden, this cause speaks, and like we've seen with um, the LGBT movement in, in America very recently. So there is hope. We can see that radical change is possible. And of course, we're talking here about the different species, uh, and it's different. There's many differences between, well, the LGBT movement and the animal rights movement, for instance. But still, we know that some things that were inconceivable 100 years ago that we have a black president in the United States, that we have a female president in the United States, that we have a moron president in the United States. Uh, all these things are happening now or are possible now. Okay? So, some interventions that are helping, and this is derived from the Meta Charity that um, is an effective altruism organization and that advises us which organizations are the best organizations in terms of animals, to give money to. Uh, so this organization, they evaluate other organizations and they also evaluate interventions, campaigns, actions, etc. And they look at what works, what's most effective. So these are people like studying things and um, modeling things. There's philosophers and mathematicians in there. And they, they, these people tr are trying to see what works. So some things that work or that seem to work. Uh, farmed animal interventions. Uh, is the topic that we're talking about. So leafleting and online ads to create consumer changes. And so the, the estimation, and this is very uncertain because these estimations are like ballpark figures. It's not easy to estimate that. But they say that uh, for online ads, so if you give money to an organization to put advertisements online, vegan or animal rights advertisements on Facebook or whatever, for um, $1 spent, you could um, spare one to 30 years of factory farm suffering. That's pretty incredible. I mean, in terms of this huge number that I named, it may not seem much, but still, even one the minimum estimate here, one year of suffering in a factory farm, avoided with just a one euro donation, is huge, of course. So we'd say that this is very tractable. Um, another thing that boils down to the same attitude shift in people is um, investigations to make what is happening inside the factory farms visible to everybody. So um, the things that are going on there, there's people going into these factory farms, recording things and putting it out through the media and showing what is happening and raising awareness. Okay. And these two things, I mean, this raising awareness can lead, ideally, to people saying, okay, I don't want no part in this industry. I want to boycott this industry because it's unethical, I don't want to support it with my money, and I hope that 
When I break on it, it will lose money if a lot of us do that. And it will change their ways or it will stop existing or whatever. Okay? So that's the idea of basically of vegetarianism and veganism. You are going to boycott uh, this whole system. And then the third one is um, welfare reforms. So you could, um, of course, ask everybody to become a vegetarian or a vegan, and that may happen someday, but in the meantime, there's also, for the animals that are in these systems, in the factory farms, we have ways to alleviate their suffering. And some people are against this, are against this idea of enlarging the cages or giving them uh, better situations or conditions. But for these animals, these improvements are very real. So I don't think it's a good idea to, for like, um, ideological reasons, be against these measures, as some people within the animal rights movement are. So here it says, 13 to 28 years of factory farm suffering spared per unit. That's even more, and it's less uncertain. It's kind of like one of the best interventions, or one of the most sure interventions that we have. And then the one that I'm personally most enthusiastic about is the development of alternatives. So we are developing at an incredible pace uh, alternatives to these animal products. And we are like in, a, I call it the, the fourth generation or the fifth generation of meat substitutes. They were, they're much better than what we have before, than the, than the cardboard um, meat alternatives or whatever. Um, we are now seeing new technology applied to develop these things. So maybe you've heard of this one, the Impossible Cheeseburger. Um, this is um, made by a world-renowned Stanford, Stanford University professor, chemistry. He said, okay, I want to, he was, he's a vegan, and he said, like, I want to take, take time off from my job. And he left his job in the end. Uh, to use his chemical knowledge, and this is an excellent example of, like, using your skills for the greater good. He used his knowledge of chemistry to try to imitate the, uh, or to try to produce the ideal meat substitute. So it's called the Impossible Cheeseburger, and it's just now hitting the market in the United States. Uh, these guys, uh, Beyond Meat, are kind of doing the same thing, and this was in the news just um, this week. One of the world's, the world's largest meat producers, Tyson Foods, a company that kills billions and billions of chickens every year, invested for 5% stake in this company. Some people think that's bad. I think that's great. I think that shows that some things are shifting. It shows that Tyson Foods, this giant in the animal industry, is guarding against the future, is hedging against the future, and wants to make sure that it has, that it's also betting on this horse. Okay? So that's really good news. These guys are trying to make sustainable seafood, and sustainable means plant-based, okay? Shrimp that are plant-based. You may think like it's crazy that we need these things, but providing these alternatives will make it easier for people to switch. Um, and so a product that, is, that might hit the shelves next year is milk, is a, a, um, a milk based on cow DNA, but without the involvement, without the further involvement of cows. So it's high-tech food, you may not like the idea, but what these guys want to do is to make a milk product that's identical, chemically, nutritionally, taste-wise, to milk, but without the involvement of the cow. It could be cheaper, it could be more nutritious, it could be more sustainable, and it's animal-free, and it's compassionate. Okay? So imagine what a, deal, what a game changer that could be. And of course, you've heard of the lab meat, we call it clean meat now. Um, clean meat means uh, meat from uh, meat that is developed from cell cultures. And this could be, according to the entrepreneurs, could be five, seven years away from hitting the market. And this could be the game changer that we are waiting for. It could be that people have this in their supermarket and they just buy this because it's cheaper, because it's healthier, because it's more sustainable, even without caring about animals. So what could happen is that all these products that most people love a lot, uh, these products, they could have them still, but without the animals. So what we see or what we need is we need to change this. 
as soon as you don't have a lot of alternatives, and as, uh, as long as you don't have a lot of alternatives, they're not available, they're too expensive, they're like hard to find, or whatever, then the required effort to change is high. Okay, we need to change this. We need to make sure these alternatives are good, they're tasty, they're affordable, they're everywhere, and the required effort to change is lowered a lot. So, one question that you could ask them is, well, suppose we make it so easy to go vegan for everybody, and they just everybody buys vegan products just because they're there, does this still entail, does this still entail a, a switch in their mind? Will their attitude change? Okay, so the thing is that um, when we think about changing behavior, we usually think of changing attitudes, and then as a result, people will change their behavior. Like this, right? I give you a leaflet, and you say, like, oh, this is interesting information. Oh, I didn't know this. This is terrible. I'll change my behavior. Of course, it's not like that. This is a, a research among ethics professors, and people ask them, researchers ask them, um, do you think it's morally okay to eat animals? And 70% of them said, no, it's not morally okay. Do you know how many people put that belief into practice? You want to guess? It wasn't higher than among the general population. So these people had the attitude change, but they didn't do the behavior change. Same for these people. 55% um, of nurses and 45% of doctors in the US are overweight. These people know what healthy food is, or they're supposed to know. They know they have the mindset about being healthy, etc., but still they can't do it. So there's a behavior, a, a gap between attitude and behavior. Okay? Fortunately, what also works, and what we often ignore, and neglect, is that behavior also influences attitude. Okay, so this is an example from um, in the US when the seatbelt laws were introduced. Many people were, were, were against those laws and said, like, I don't want to wear this seatbelt. Um, but they had to because, because it was a law. And a couple of years later, they researched these, these same people and they asked, What do you think of this law? And they said, Good law. Uh, so they, they changed in terms of their attitude, right? What happened was that they changed their attitude after they had to change their behavior. Maybe they saw it wasn't that difficult. Maybe they wanted to put them or to reconcile their attitude with the behavior that they had to do. But we know that this is how it very often works, that we change behavior first, we'll skip this, and that attitude changes afterwards. So thanks to these meat alternatives, changing your behavior and changing your attitude becomes easier. So this lab meat might be technological revolution that precedes the moral revolution. I'm going to end with a couple of minutes more with one topic that I didn't mention yet, and which is the most controversial topic. And that's the topic of wild animals. And maybe you think that this is not our concern, this is nature. This is what happens out there. So this we may be concerned about. This is a hunter shooting rabbits, and it's terrible, and we don't like the hunter, and we don't want him to do that. But what's the difference between or with this animal suffering from myxomatosis? which is a terrible disease in nature. Is the suffering any less bad because we didn't cause it? Should we only care about suffering that we caused, that we are responsible for? This elephant was um, killed because people wanted to take his or her tusks. And this elephant, who still has the tusks, was killed because of drought, maybe a slower death. Or this one was killed by carnivores. Is the suffering any less bad because we didn't cause it? You remember the graphic with wild fish? Wild fish are the fish that we caught, catch in the sea. But now if we, if we add all the wild animals in the world, then these are what we are left with, and this is what we added. This is wild fish that we don't catch, that are uh, killed by other predators, etc. Wild amphibians and reptiles. So the number here, I didn't put it here because it becomes too high to, for me even to know what number this is, so to speak. Okay. So what I want to say is, this is maybe the next frontier after we've veganized the world, 
then maybe we have to start caring about the suffering of animals in the wild. And um, I just want to be want you to be like practice small opinion about this and think about it because it's potentially the biggest source of suffering in the world. And maybe in the future we can do something about it. I'll skip this. So, not to make this too heavy, but this world and the people and the animals on it may be around for quite some time. If we don't kill ourselves, then maybe we live thousands and thousands of years in the future. And who knows what can happen in that time. And there's a lot of people who are very negative and desperate about the human species. I think we're getting better. I believe we're getting better at doing good, getting better at being human. This conference would not have happened 200 years ago, or it wouldn't have happened with the skills that we have today, with the technology that we have today. So who can imagine what could happen if we're still around in 2000, 4000, 5000, 100,000 years time? We could be saving many people, many animals. We could even go to other planets and save creatures that are suffering over there. If we're around for that time, that's where we may go. So think big picture. Think about people who are developing maybe in the right direction and who are developing all kinds of capacities, technological, emotional, intellectual, to do good. Thank you very much. take into account the amount of consciousness per animal species. Mm -hmm. That's why I think, is it correct to make that way of uh, thinking? Yeah. For instance, if we would eat snails, are we going to compare the life of a snail to the life of an elephant? Yeah. And then calculate how many snails go into an elephant. It's a good point. And um, indeed, when we want to assess the impact of suffering or the suffering that there is in the world, we have to take into account the difference in capacities for suffering among different creatures. Which is why, you know, the very last pie chart, I could give you one more that's even more spectacular. That, that's the one with insects. But I didn't show you that one. Because it gets completely crazy at that point. Uh, but it's a good point, and um, snails might not be, might not have the same capacities for suffering as elephants, and that's why we can discount them more than we can discount animals. And of course, there's also a lot of uncertainty in this, and uh, we've made mistakes before uh, trying to assess the capacity of animals. So I would, I would try to, uh, I would tell you that you should be careful in that, and that we, we shouldn't discount animals too easily. Um, but I agree with you, like, we, sh we probably, it probably doesn't make sense to put muscles at the same level of pigs or dogs or whatever. Yeah? I wanted to react to him a bit. <coughs> um, I think if you would, for example, to give you an example, if you would rip out a spider's leg or you cut out off an elephant's leg, you would be much more affected by what you see with the elephant just because he has much larger for us to recognize facial features and things like that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they both just have a nervous system. Do you know what I mean? I understand you very well. And the same with the snail. I think if you would cut the snail in half or you would cut an elephant in half, the elephant would be a lot more shocking, but it wouldn't necessarily be more suffering. No, but we can't know either way. So we, we yeah. some some animals may not suffer when we pull out one of. Them. I mean, they told me that about uh, some spiders or whatever. Or you know, I don't know if it's true, but but there are possibilities that there are differences. So I think it's a valid point. I, but I think we have to be really careful about about making those distinctions also. I yeah. take your point, and I don't want to jump into conclusions. However, I think that just as was said about uh, effective altruism, that we need more studies about the central nervous system, the capacity yeah. to suffer the uh, consciousness in different animal species. Yeah, that's definitely a focus within within the community. There's definitely a focus on research to assess uh, 
Also, for instance, in the wild, how much are animals actually suffering in the wild? We don't really know that. We can assume there's a lot of suffering in the wild. We don't know how much it is. It's, it's, it's also very hard to assess when, at what point, a life is worth living, and at what point it's better to not be alive. Very difficult philosophical questions, scientific questions. There's a lot of things open for discovery. Maybe some of you can go into this field. Maybe you mentioned already, but there seems to be some kind of taboo about helping animals in the wild because it's nature and because mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to change. You think because yeah, we, it, this actually within the effective altruist community and not, not in the whole community. That's actually one of the only domains where I see people being really concerned about that topic. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad about that. It's not an easy topic. It's a topic that's very controversial, and many people, even vegetarians and vegans, will say, like, this is not our business, we didn't cause it, you shouldn't meddle with nature, we're just going to make it worse, etc., etc., etc. I think it's really worth investigating, because the potential to do good there is very high. One more? I have two questions, one about the wild animals. Um, so if we take the example of the elephant who gets attacked by the lions, what are we going to do about them? Yeah. Are we going to give them yeah. I actually didn't want to put it in there because I know this question is going to come, but I like the picture. Uh, but, uh, but that's a good question. And that's, that's one of the things where I would say, like, we cannot really imagine what's going to be possible in the future. If we are around here for in the year 5,000, the year 7,000, we cannot imagine what kind of, like, technology or whatever we're going to have available to us to maybe do something about this. And I think whatever we think about it, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just say, like, let nature be nature. I think that's just, for me, that's, that's bullshit. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with that. I think there's suffering there. If, if a person is struck by a natural disaster, we think it's bad. Why wouldn't we think that it's bad when an animal is struck by a natural disaster. The pain, the suffering, is the same. There's no no line anymore between us and nature. It's all one thing, so we can care about it. Could you, could you tell us something about uh, what is known about how healthy these lab meats are, or how... Yeah. We don't know that much about it yet, but we know that we have at least the potential there to change the chemical structure and the substance and the nutrients of those uh, of those products. So if we say that, for instance, um, well, it would be interesting if meat had something more, some more of this or of that, we could more easily add it than to the real conventional meat. We could add vitamins and minerals, etc. We could reduce fat uh, content, etc. So there could be uh, advantages. Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah, it would be also more. It would also be better in, in terms of food safety and in terms of like pathogens, etc. Probably because it's a cleaner environment and a more controllable environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't see a problem, an ethical problem in eating it. Uh, maybe I could be, feel disgusted or something. I would at least try it once because I would be curious. Mm -hmm. How do you tackle the problem of animals destroying uh, forests? Animals destroying forests. Animals in excess. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. It's, it's, a, it's a dilemma often, like when there's too many animals are around and they may be damaging not only their environment, but damaging each other. When there's too many, they suffer because of hunger, etc. And then you could ask, like, maybe it would be better at some point to, uh, to, mercy kill, to do some mercy killing, to, 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 uh, to make sure that there's not too many of them so that uh, the ones that are there don't have it too bad. So, yeah, there's a lot of dilemmas in here. And many people, especially in the vegan movement, think we've got it all figured out. And there's no dilemmas anymore, there's no questions anymore, but there's really also interesting dilemmas to intellectually think about and philosophize about. Okay, we'll end it here. Thank you, Dr. Tobias.